The history of computing is about problem solving, it's about success, it's about failure, it's about a lot of trial and error, it's a lot of complicated steps toward innovation and then a breakthrough. And that's the way life works in Silicon Valley. But more than that, it's really about people. And we work as hard on capturing and telling the people stories at the museum as we do the machine and hardware stories. And I, so I think when you come here, you'll get the vibe of Silicon Valley, you'll get a bit of how computing and innovation works, and you'll learn a lot about the people who've changed the world. I love the Babbage Engine because it's such a model of the way I think great computing and great innovation works. Charles Babbage was a brilliant mathematician and the problem that he was trying to solve of course was these books of um, log tables that were filled with typographical errors. All of the calculations had to be done by hand, they had to be transcribed by hand, they had to be typeset by hand. The margin for error in the publications of these books was phenomenal and British Armadas were finding themselves hundreds or thousands of miles off course because they were using these error-filled books to try to do the most basic calculations. Those things were happening throughout industrial Britain at the time as well. So Babbage dreamed of a special purpose, extremely sophisticated calculator that would take all the guesswork and the human intervention out of generating these tables, these answers. And it was exactly the right approach to exactly the right problem. The difficulty was that, like many entrepreneurs, Babbage had a brilliant idea but couldn't get it funded. And he never got further than building a piece of the engine, but he built the blueprints for the full engine in fantastic detail. So 150 years later or more, engineers and museum specialists in London decide they're going to build the Babbage engine from Babbage's plans using the materials that would have been available to Babbage in the early 1800s. And of course they assemble it mostly, they didn't get all of it finished to Babbage's specification, but when they put it together they discovered it worked exactly <laughs> like Babbage had predicted. There is a second engine that was built. The first one is in London. The second one is here at the museum. And it is the complete Babbage engine because Babbage not only envisioned this enormously complicated two-ton machine with 8,000 moving parts, but he envisioned a printer and he envisioned a stamper that would create the plate from which the book could be printed. <laughs> so it was really the complete solution. And Babbage dreamed of of warehouses full of these machines being driven by steam engines so they'd be constantly calculating and our machine which we crank every day at two o'clock pacific time uh, is now uh, working exactly as Babbage envisioned so that whole story is I think so special it's a brilliant mind solving a difficult problem with an incredibly well engineered solution who yet as brilliant as he was couldn't get it funded died embittered and wondering what the world might have been if he'd been able to create it. And a generation later, entrepreneurs, if you will, working on those plans and making it come to life. And so for audiences here at the museum to see the Babbage engine work and hear that story is a really very special thing. I love our uh, recreation of the Atanasoff Berry computer. First of all, it's the only one that exists. Uh, it was built exactly according to the plans that uh, John Vincent Atanasoff and Clifford Berry devised at Iowa State in the 1930s. It, of course, was the subject of the very famous patent dispute that destroyed, destroyed all of Eckerd and Mockley's original patents on the ENIAC and the birth of electronic computing. Uh, as Gordon Bell calls it, it was the disinvention of the computer. Uh, and it's also, I think, very interesting because um, 
At Nassau himself is not well known in history. Uh, neither are Eckert and Mockley, uh, neither is John von Neumann, uh, Conrad Zusa, uh, all these people who worked on the Manchester Baby and uh, the Williams uh, Kilburn tubes. Uh, those are not well known people, but you can stand in that gallery here, which is called uh, The Birth of the Computer, and you can see the ABC computer in all of its simplicity, standing right next to the Johnny Act, von Neumann's famous computer, and one of the first Williams Kilburn tubes, and uh, the Enigma encoding machine, which was next to a film about code breaking in World War II. And so much of history comes together in the space of about a thousand square feet with the real machine sitting there. And I, that whole gallery is special to me, but the the At Nassau Ferry computer, especially so because of At Nassau in particular. Uh, I love the Apollo Guidance computer. The Apollo Guidance Computer is a fantastic example of a problem that had to be solved if we were to go to the moon. And it was solved with, at that time, the state of the art in uh, integrated circuitry. And it did just enough of what it needed to do to get us to the moon and back. And, you know, today we would laugh because it's so uh, so much of a pipsqueak next to someone who wants to come and pose next to a to, with holding up an iPhone uh, and, and have pictures taken and people tweet those pictures all the time uh, but it was very special and it it's, it's one of a kind and it's the story of a group of people who had to come together and make that work and and I that to me is very special um, right next to that as it happens just physically in the gallery is the IBM 360. Great, great story, not only because of the system, but because it was a bet the company decision by Tom Watson. He, in that period of the 1960s, spent what would today be the equivalent of about $60 billion in R&D money on a single project, which succeeded in, in charted IBM's course for the next half century, and if it had failed, would have sunk the company. And then you look at the people who were working on it, Fred Brooks and uh, so many of the other engineers who made that system special, just very brave, very dedicated people. Um, the semiconductor gallery, if you come to the museum, is a really special, uh, a really special gallery. Uh, we have uh, uh, wonderful examples of uh, wafers as small as a nickel and as large as bigger than a dinner plate. Uh, and you can see the evolution over time of how complicated it is to make a microprocessor and how difficult the science is. Uh, we've got uh, a replica of Jack Kilby's <clears throat> notebook open to the page in September 1958 where he records for the first time his whole design for his version of the integrated circuit. Uh, sitting there in Texas Instruments is told uh, by his bosses, you know, in the middle of a Texas summer, don't work on this idea, Jack. We all know you're in love with it, but you've got another job. They all leave on vacation, and what does Kilby do but spend the month working on the integrated circuit? Comes back to his bosses in September, hooks it up to an oscilloscope, and it works exactly as he predicted. At the very same moment, out here at Fairchild, Noyce and Moore and Ernie and Last are working on the same idea. And within a period of months, literally the Big Bang in computing has happened and everything changes. And there you turn a corner and you, you go down what I call application alley. Because in very quick succession you go to artificial intelligence and robotics and graphics and music and art and then Xerox PARC, the birth of the graphical interface, the mouse, uh, the corded keyboard that Doug Engelbart invented, gaming, the first Pong machine, the birth of Atari, all the gaming companies that came after that, the personal computer, the Macintosh, IBM PC battles, a million different flavors of PCs that flourished out from under that, mobile computing, the internet, the World Wide Web, and then a theater called What's Next. So 
you go through this in very quick succession after you go through the integrated circuit and you come to a world that we're experiencing in a very personal way now, but yet once you've walked through it, you know that somehow we're still only just at the beginning.